And so just returning to the, the main verse that we looked at uh, is you must, have, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love God with all your heart. There's a battle going on for control of our hearts. The battle is waged daily. The battle will never stop. The devil is not going to give up. The devil is not going to take a time out. The devil is not going to go to sleep. The devil is going to be at work all the time, every day, to try to gain the upper hand and to not try to gain superiority of your heart. And this is why the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Read the words, meditate on those words. These are hostile words. This is not, you have an enemy out there, and you know, he's, he's a little guy. Just, he, he'll, he'll be like a little chihuahua nipping at your feet, but not, no, no damage will be caused. No, he's not that animal. He is someone he's out to devour. He's described as a lion. A chihuahua facing me, I'm not, I'm not going to be bothered by a chihuahua. If I were in the presence of a lion, how that would happen, I don't know. But if I was in the presence of a lion where he was standing before me, that would be something different. My response to the chihuahua would be different than it would be to the lion. The lion is out to devour me. And and our enemy, the devil, is out to devour us as well. Another version says this. The devil would like nothing better than to catch you napping. He would like nothing better than to catch you napping. And so we need to guard our heart. We said that's the post of guard, post of sentry. Having some mechanism in place that we're watching over the entry to our hearts. What's going in and what's going out? Friend or foe? Halt. Who goes there? What's the password? And if that thing that's trying to enter in is not friend, then it's going to be your enemy and it's going to be out to destroy you. You might remember what now has become a computer term, but before it was a computer term, it was based in, in history, which is the Trojan horse. And the idea was that this one group of people was uh, not, not doing well in their, their fighting against this other people. So this horse, this big, humongous horse is created, and it was going to be given as a gift to the opposing army, but it was hollowed out on the inside, and the other army had put their soldiers on the inside. So, this, so the, their, their enemy received the gift with gladness, but then the opposing forces came out of the horse and then def- defeated them. And this is what the, the devil would like to do as well, to, to kind of sneak some things in, appearing to be friendly, appearing to be, this is just a gift for you. It's just a, come on. Are you actually going to refuse a gift? You ever have somebody do that to you? <laughs> like try to make you feel guilty because you don't want what they're offering? It's just this, and you know that thing that that they want you to have is actually not going to be good for you. Maybe it's illegal already, or maybe it's something that is legal, but you know it's not going to produce any good fruit. And sometimes they say, well, come on, I'm your friend. Right? You you get the guilt. You get the guilt trip from people. And these kind of things, we don't manufacture. These kind of things are actually from the devil. The Bible says he's he's a liar from the beginning, He's the father of lies. You think of that. Just, I don't know if you ever thought about that. Meditate on that for a second. The father of lies, which means every lie, every lie that's ever been said or will be said comes from seeds he's sown because he's the father of lies. And then to turn, returning to Proverbs chapter 4, uh, guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. And so I think we ended there last week. The contents of your heart will determine your destiny. Well, God determines our destiny. The contents of your heart will determine your destiny. Whether it's going to be a, a wonderful journey with a great end or a difficult journey with a tragic end. It's all based on what's going on in our hearts. So I want to take a look back at the devil's heart today because the devil has a heart too. The Bible talks about the heart of God. The Bible actually speaks of the devil's heart too. 
And it might be good for us to see what's in his heart to see how we got where we are today. What's going on with this guy that brought us to where we are today? In Ezekiel chapter 28, speaking to Lucifer, your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by, love, by your love of splendor. And it tells us that his heart was filled with pride. So where did this whole downfall begin? It started within his own heart. It started within his own heart. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14 says, speaking again of Lucifer, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And we see two things from Ezekiel and from Isaiah, that Lucifer's downfall started in his heart. Pride rose up in his heart, and he began to speak to himself in his heart. The musings of our hearts are problematic if they're not the right things. When we allow, and, and so Satan, we can see that uh, he, he had a corrupted heart, and that corruption is still being put forth today. And if we allow that corruption into our hearts, then we're going to start thinking about those things that we've allowed in there. And as we begin to meditate and think on the corruption he's put in there, then our minds become darkened to the Word of God. We have to guard our hearts, church. We have to guard over the contents of our hearts. We have to watch over what we're allowing in. We're seeing so many people who say they're believers being overthrown and defeated, walking in defeat. There's a difference between being attacked and being defeated. There's a great difference between being attacked and being defeated. And I didn't ask him to, if I could say this, so I'm not going to mention names, but we went to a friend's house this last uh, couple days, and, and uh, uh, they were affected by the hurricane. They went through Ian, and it destroyed their house. Now this storm came in, and it caused problems for them again. They, their house got watered in again. But here's the story I want to tell because it's a great testimony of God's goodness. Number one, they stood and fought. They erected some barriers around their house. They put some pumps inside the house. They fought all night. The water is, is he, has, he had a couple of pumps that are pumping out 6,000 gallons an hour. As the water's coming, and he's pumping it out as fast as he can. Did water get in their house? Yes. But in Ian, they were defeated because their house was consumed by water, six feet high. But this time, they fought and fought and fought. They took on the battle. They didn't run away, but they took on the battle. And they weren't defeated. They were attacked, but they weren't defeated. There's a difference between being attacked and being defeated. And they could have laid down and said, no, forget it, threw their hands in the air, but they didn't do that. And so they did some things naturally that they, they knew they should be doing while they relied on God for strength for the spiritual side. And come on, it was a miraculous thing, and, and so we just praise God for his goodness. But come on, it's a, there's a difference between being attacked and being defeated. And many young people and many adults are being defeated because the devil is infiltrating their hearts. He's getting inside. The contamination is not growing on the outside, it's growing on the inside. Once you allow it in, it begins to grow. It begins to, it's, it's like a cancer. It divides and begins to, the cells begin to multiply. And so we can't allow these things in. I believe that some of the things we're seeing in culture right now, from young people to old people, when Pastor Rob mentioned it, which is depression. I've seen so many people depressed. Is depression real? The answer is yes. I'm not trying to say it's not. Depression is real. But I've never known so many young people as in the current age who've been depressed. And I believe it's because, partly because of the information being provided through technology that's readily available that if we're not careful, right, set a guard over your heart. Right? So we don't set a guard. We just keep. And 
everyone's vulnerable to what they see and what they read, but young people are very vulnerable. Because perhaps they haven't had a background of developing ways to keep things out. Perhaps they haven't fully formulated their thoughts regarding spiritual things or, or life at all. And people come along and tell them, this is what it's supposed to be like, and this is what you're supposed to be like, and this is what... And so the depression's at an all-time high. And some of these things can be prevented by placing that guard over our hearts and not allowing these things to infiltrate. We see the devil's heart from the very beginning was a problem. And he did say, there were five things he said. I will, he didn't say, I'm, I'm thinking about doing these things. I will do these things, he said. And the last one he said is, I will be like the most high. I will be like God himself. So this is his aim, this is his goal. And where God has our good in his heart, and God has planned a future for us that is uh, full of greatness and joy, and all God asks us to do is give him our hearts and to worship him, what do you think the devil wants from you? If he's going to be like the Most High, he wants the same thing. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. So one of them is going to get your allegiance. The Bible says there's only two kingdoms. Oh, I don't think that's true. Think what you want. The Bible says on the authority of Scripture, two kingdoms, kingdom of light and kingdom of darkness. And we all give our allegiances to one of those kingdoms. Well, I just don't know about that God thing, so I'm, I don't really give my allegiance to anybody. If you say no to God, by default, you're saying yes to darkness. If you say no to light, you by default are accepting darkness. I don't believe in that either. It doesn't matter. You're already dark because you, you, you rejected truth. As soon as you reject truth, now you're walking in darkness. And so the devil's out to seize control. He's out to infiltrate our hearts. He tries to do it through manipulating our thoughts, manipulating our emotions. I I can't tell you how many times Debbie and I talk to people and and some of them are just so focused on their own emotion. And is emotion real? Absolutely. Absolutely. But your emotions can deceive you, and Satan knows that, so he manipulates your emotions. Things like, I, I just don't feel like praying. I don't, I don't really feel like God's here. I don't, I don't really feel like... I, 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 I... We need to get our attention, some, some need to get their attention off themselves and say, wait a minute, this feeling I have, this is just to lead me astray. This feeling that I just don't feel like God is real. Your feelings have nothing to do with it. There are people who don't feel gravity is real either, but to their own demise. Test gravity out if you want. I don't feel like it. (laughs) And so God is looking for your heart, but make no mistake, there is a battle being waged between these two kingdoms, and the battle being waged is you. You're the prize. But the devil is bullying you around while God is just sticking out his hand, extending a, a warm hand to you. Jesus said, follow me. Jesus says, follow me. And the devil comes along. Follow me. And we let him thump on our heads. And we allow him to proclaim his foolishness. And we allow ourselves back to this thing, to watch and listen and read the foolishness. And sometimes even adults, I love adults. Uh, young people, when they say dumb things, I just write it out because they're young. But when old people say, or older people say dumb stuff, I'm like, that's just dumb. Um, but the thing, the thing that old, older people say about a lot of things, about a lot of things, to somehow give credence to decisions they make, I can, I can handle this. 
I can handle this. You know, if I read that kind of stuff, it doesn't bother me. I can handle it. You know, if I, if I, if I go to the bar and drink a few drinks, I can handle it. If I go out with my friends and they go to this particular kind of club, it doesn't bother me. I, I can handle it. And I don't believe that God said, listen, uh, put yourself in these positions and then handle it. I believe the Bible says that you should flee. In fact, it, it, it goes even further to say this, that you should avoid the appearance of evil. The appearance of it should be avoided. There's, so we should not have an attitude, I can handle this. So I'm reading through here, and it's, you know, I know it's, it's blood and gore. I know it's witchcraft. I know it, it's negativity. I know it, but I can handle it. Sometimes students uh, in school, you know, buy gifts for teachers, and, and I received a, a DVD one year, and um, I won't mention the title, but the student was so happy to give it to me, and I looked at it, and I said, yeah. Uh, I said, so what do you think? I said, I don't think I'll watch it. They said, why not? I said, because I like to sleep at night. Because it was a title. I don't even have to know what the story is. The title is enough to, for, to tell me that this is something that it's going gonna, it's gonna to bother me. It's going to disturb me. And I could have easily said, you can handle it. Man up. Man up. That's another thing the devil does to you, just so you know. With men, he's got us. If, 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 we're, if we're stupid enough to take that bait, we're in trouble. Come on, be a man. Be a man. I am being a man. And a man of God says no to evil. <laughs> the Bible says Christ is the head of every man. So when I man up, I'm allowing Christ to be my head, my authority, my Lord. So you're cheap shot, Mr. Devil. Man up. Won't you be a man? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going for that. That's, that's, that's playground stuff. That's playground stuff. I was around a couple of teenagers the other day, and I don't know what happened, but there was some disagreement between them. <laughs> so I look at the one to which he says, <laughs> she started it, and I'm thinking, playground stuff. That's, that's, child, that's child's play. You have to mature out of that and say, okay, this is what men do, this is what women do. This is what men of God do, this is what women of God do. And so we have to know our enemy, we have to know that he's out to get us, we have to know that he's out to overthrow truth. He's out to overthrow truth. And he does it very well. The Bible wouldn't call him crafty or subtle if he wasn't good at it. And he markets well. And he markets through a variety of avenues. There are some places in Florida and other states you can drive through. Naples is not one of them because they don't allow it, but, but billboards. You can go places. You ever drive up uh, I-4 or I-75 and some of those billboards, you're like, you got kids in the car. <laughs> you get close to Georgia. He's advertising everywhere. You, you figure you're on this, this website you go to, it's safe, Right? And then some of them, all of a sudden, there's this ad pops up. You're like, what's that doing on this website? Even on Bible app, uh, even on Bible uh, websites, you'll find stuff that comes up like, what's that doing here? And so he's out to market against, market you. He's out to get your heart. He's out to capture you. The Bible says a lot about the human heart, however. And in Jeremiah, he talks about dece deceitful hearts. Jeremiah chapter 17, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. So let me give you some, some, some advice in passing here about this, this idea that the human heart is deceitful above all things. Because there's this idea of just, just, just listen to your heart. Uh, if you have a renewed heart, you should pay attention to your heart. If your heart is unrenewed, well, I'm a Christian. If your heart is unrenewed, but I'm a Christian. If your heart is unrenewed, then you shouldn't pay attention to it because it's going to... It's going to make stuff up. If you haven't renewed your mind and it's affected your heart, then there's wickedness and deceitfulness bound up in your heart. But I'm a Christian. Eh. 
There's no reason for the Bible to tell us that we need to renew the way we think if it was just automatic. It's not automatic. And you have to make sure you are cautious about the contents of your heart. So the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and openly wicked. Uh, The Bible talks about hypocritical hearts. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Assuredly, assuredly, you look like righteous people. Or outwardly, you look like... uh, uh, My eyes. Uh, Outwardly, you look like the righteous people. But inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. You look good on the outside. But your heart's dark. Now, just a word of advice to those, those of you who might be uh, young and single or old and single, and you, maybe, you're looking for, maybe you're looking for a partner in life. He may look good on the outside. She may look good on the outside. But you better be figuring out what's inside their hearts. They may look like believers outwardly, but you better find out what's inside their hearts. Sad to say, but I've, I've known of people who have, ma- mainly males, who come to church not because they love God, but because they're going to play the part. Because church girls are, uh, can be naive. And you think, that, you think I'm making that up? That's true. I've known guys to do that. So he talks about deceitful hearts. The Bible talks about hypocritical hearts. The Bible talks about doubtful hearts. Jesus uh, is, is, uh, appears to his disciples. says the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. This is after his resurrection. And he says, why are you, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? And so we can have doubtful hearts. We can have troubled hearts. In John chapter 14, verse 1. This is before the resurrection, or not before the resurrection, before this crucifixion, and he's talking to his disciples, and about, hey, I'm I'm going away. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. We can have troubled hearts. Human beings can have troubled hearts. We can have betrayed hearts. In uh, John chapter 13, verse number 2, this is Judas, or Jesus speaking to Judas at the Last Supper. It says, the supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The devil put it into his heart. Well, now, we already wrote about, read about the devil's heart and the things he wants to do. This is what I said in my heart. I'm going to be like God. And so all of God's creation that he's, he wants to worship him, I'm going to ensnare them and have them worship me instead. And so he works on our hearts. And this is very, very clear The devil put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Now, when we say that the devil put it in there, it wasn't as if Judas didn't have a part to play. The devil didn't just somehow get that that thought inside of Judas. If you know anything about Judas' past, Judas was a thief. (laughs) He was put over the, the, the treasury that the disciples had. And the Bible says that he used to help himself to what was put into it. This 30 pieces of silver that happened for the betrayal of Jesus, those seeds were planted long before. The devil planted seeds of him in him long before that. And he kept meditating on it. And that meditation led to him stealing from the purses of the money that they had in their treasury. And ultimately, that desire for money consumed him. So when the thought of betrayal came, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an amazing leap. It was another step, another step in the process. The devil had been working on him, and he'd been, he'd been losing the battle along the way. He was under attack, and he never fought back. He was under attack, and he never fought back. The Bible also talks about greedy hearts. Acts chapter 5, verse number 3. This is where uh, Peter is talking to Ananias. He said, but, uh, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan... Fills your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And while it was sold, and after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing where? In your heart. It says, he says initially, Satan has filled your heart, but then he asks the question, why 
have you conceived this thing? Satan brings it along and he meditates on it. He doesn't push it out. He doesn't cast it back. He meditates on it. That meditation leads to an action. And that action leads to a tragic end for Ananias and for his wife, actually. We can all day long say, I can handle this. I got this. I got this on lock. But you probably don't. In fact, any t- listen to me. Anytime we utter the words, I've got this, we should be cautious because you know what that sounds like? P-R-I-D-E. And that was the original thing we read about with Satan, with Lucifer. Pride has, had filled his heart. And his, maybe, maybe if he, he spoke that way in those days, maybe he looking at God, I got this. Your creation is mine. I got this. And he's been taunting God ever since. And he's been trying to prove, to show that he actually is the one that people will worship. And walk out today, and anywhere you drive in the streets, go to a store, anywhere you walk, go out today, you're going to find people who are worshiping the enemy. They're in it for themselves. You don't matter. Come on, all these people blowing through red lights now, all these accidents taking place. People blowing through red lights. Just, just Maybe just park along a, a, a street one day and just watch how many people blow in red lights. You know what that tells me? It's all about you, baby. <laughs> you don't care about anything or anybody. It's all about you getting to where you want to be when you want to be there. So we have to be careful about pride. We have to be careful about uh, having our hearts that are filled with greed. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? When I was young, I had a friend I used to hang around with, and I don't know that he was the best of friends, but he was my friend. My mother felt like he wasn't a good match. Uh, and uh, on occasion, uh, I would come home and I would act out, to which my mother would say, she would pose this question, who have you been hanging around with? Which we could translate into, why have you conceived this thing in your heart, son? But she knew, and I didn't know until I got older, my associations, my friends actually influenced my own behavior, my own thinking. And so she said, he's not a good match for you. And I'm, you're my friend. And now, for as long as I've been an adult working with teenagers, that's I hear all the time, they're my friend. Maybe you need better friends because your friend's going to cause you to destroy your life. What do you know, old man? I've lived longer than you. I'm telling you, it's true. <laughs> and so the, the, work, the work of Satan is to infiltrate our hearts, to implant thoughts, to implant ideas. He's the enemy of God, and he's the enemy of man. If we allow him to infiltrate our hearts, he will fill it with all kinds of evil and vile affections. And this is why the Bible tells us to guard our hearts above all else. Above all else. If you have a car with a key fob, see, back in the old days, you locked your car, you either pushed it down, held the thing in and shut it and then pulled on it, or uh, you got out and you put the key in and turned and you watched the thing go boom, boom. <laughs> but now, lots of cars don't even have the things you can see. So you walk away. Anybody ever walk away? You lock your car and then, like, like Debbie does this to me all the time, and maybe you do it to yourself or somebody around you. Did you lock the car? So what do you do? You hit it, beep, beep. Locked. Did we lock the house? I don't know. Did you lock? I don't know. Drive back home. Why? Because you want to safeguard your property. Why do you want your car locked? To safeguard your property. And every time, if you have a key fob, every time you go, boop, boop, I'd like you to be thinking, do I have a lock on my heart? Am I locking the door to my heart? 
Every time you hear that boop, boop, whether it's honk, honk, or whatever your car does, let that be a reminder to you. Am, am I guarding my heart the same way? Am I watching over the door of my heart, filtering information that's coming in, determining what should pass and what should not pass, what gets in and what does not get in? Now, let's look at the, that was, that was Satan's work, but let's look at, work, look at the work of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God's at work too. The Spirit of God is at work too. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 18, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Where Satan's trying to fill you up with one thing, God wants to fill you up with something else. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And again, in passing, don't be drunk with wine. Don't be drunk. Don't drink. Here's, here's the thing about this scripture. People are like, well, it doesn't say, you know, it just says don't get drunk. So that just means, I, I love when people make these kind of statements. Oh, my gosh. And if you're a drinker, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize. Listen, um, uh, drinking, number one, is problematic because you're giving control of your life to some substance because it does alter. It, is, it does alter what goes on in the inside, number one. Number two, the Scripture is actually making a contrast here. You're drinking, you're drinking alcohol because you're trying to feel good. You're trying to get some kind of buzz, some kind of rush, some kind of high. But he didn't stop there. He said, don't do it. Come on, that's just not good. He said, hey, be filled with the Spirit. Here's the, here's the alternative. What you're missing out is on the alternative. You've been sold a bill of goods by the enemy who trying to overthrow the truth of God by saying this is what you need, but I'm telling you that the Bible says this is what you need. It's the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Spirit of God. You're still trying to satisfy your, yourself with all this craziness. The Bible says you want joy? comes from the Holy Ghost. You want love? Comes from the Holy Ghost. You want peace? Comes from the Holy Ghost. Oh, I just feel all mellowed out when I do this. <laughs> well, get, get, get in, in a relationship with the Holy Spirit and see what kind of peace you have. See what kind of mellow you can get on. That's not popular in churches anymore because people in churches love to drink. And I'm trying to figure that one out because I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to find all I need in that, in, in that experience. Be filled with the Spirit. Yeah, that's what I want. And he goes on to say, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourself, making music to the Lord. Where? In your hearts. It's all about our hearts, man. What's on the inside? If you're filling yourself up with the things of God and you're allowing the Spirit of God to fill you on the inside, something's going to come out. And it's not going to be blankety blank, blank, blank. God will put a, put a song in your heart. The Spirit of God will put a song in your heart. And some of those songs aren't meant for public exhibition. Sometimes it's you. And sometimes you start singing, like, man, where'd those lyrics come from? It comes from fellowship. The Bible says we can have joyful hearts. Psalm chapter 28, the Lord is my strength and shield. I trust in him with all my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. We can have thankful hearts. Colossians 3.16, let the message about Christ in all its rich richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. So we can have joyful hearts. We can have thankful hearts. 1 Timothy 1.5, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. A pure heart. So we can have pure hearts, not dark hearts, not impure hearts, but pure hearts. Perhaps many of us, if not all of us, have been around little children. And sometimes the great joy of being around little children is because they haven't been corrupted. And their hearts are so tender. And their hearts are so pure. 
and they say things that are that sometimes are just almost like revelation from God when they speak sometimes because it's so simple. And sometimes they had that childhood laughter. <laughs> and sometimes you can't help like, you know, I don't know what you're laughing about, kid, but that, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to laugh along with you. This is funny. And being tenderhearted so we, so we can have joyful hearts, we can have thankful hearts, we can have pure hearts, but it's all going to come from a guarded heart. We need guarded hearts. And so living here in Collier for so many years now, uh, you ever noticed all of the storage units? All of the storage units. They're everywhere. And sometimes because people come from other places and you get to Collier, uh, many, of the, many of the bedrooms are much smaller. <laughs> and the room, so you have all this stuff and you're like, where's it going to go? And so you rent storage space. Sometimes older people are downsizing. Hey, we had this, this space for way too long. They get a smaller place, but then, uh-oh. And then sometimes people just have too much stuff. Many Americans have too much stuff. And so rent the storage unit to put our stuff in. And so there's, there's one storage unit that, that just caught my attention. They're driving down uh, Pine Ridge. It's called Hideaway. Hideaway storage. And that is what our hearts are like. It's a hideaway storage. You can't see the contents, but there's stuff, there's stuff stored in there. Whether you want there to be or not, there's stuff stored in that facility. Your heart is a storage unit for good or for evil. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, a good man brings things out of, a good, uh, out of the good stored up in his heart. But the evil man brings out things that are of the evil stored in his heart. And it goes on to say, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And this is how sometimes we're, we're, we're raising children and they start saying certain things. We're like, hmm. And especially if you're a Christian parent, you realize something's going on inside their heart because they're saying things that are not Okay. My child's saying things that leads me to believe they're on the wrong path. And if they're saying these things, then something's going on in here. There's some contamination taking place. We've got to figure out how to deal with that contamination. And so come on, parents, if you have children, do not neglect to listen, hear, and figure out what, what does my child need? How do we decontaminate? How do we get in them what they need? How do we reestablish a heart in purity? Your children are not off limits to the devil. They're not. You can say all day long, this is rated this. Okay, whatever. <laughs> the devil laughs at those ratings. And, and your children are a prize to be won as well. Oh, but they're little. They're not ready for battle. He doesn't care. Tell the lion in the jungles of Africa, on the savanna, taking, take, taking off after the herd, and the little one cuts loose. Does he say, oh, it's just a little baby. I want bigger prey. Uh-uh. He goes for the weak and vulnerable. And the children are weak. The young ones are weak. And they are vulnerable. So moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, church members, just watch over our little ones. Making sure we're providing protection. David said in Psalm chapter 19, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. The words of my mouth and meditation of my heart. Well, the meditation of your heart is going to determine the words out of your mouth. So... Let's get our hearts meditating on the right thing. I can handle this. No, stop it. Get your hearts meditating on the right things. And so in this storage unit, we're going to fill things up. And the Bible says in Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I put your word on the inside of me so I won't sin against you. Everything I'm telling you today is trying to focus on the heart, 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 your heart. Pay attention to your heart. Pay attention to what you're allowing into your heart. I don't even know how I got so far off. It started with your heart. Something got in and you entertained it. Psalm 
Something got in and you entertained it, or you didn't cast it out, or you didn't throw it out, or you didn't sanitize. Many years ago, a man wrote an article, and in part of that article, he, made, he, he mentioned a phrase, and then some people caught, up, caught on that phrase, and it actually became a lot of stuff after that. It was like the 1980s, but it was called broken window syndrome. And he put forth the theory, the idea, the notion that in a community where a window is broken on a business or a home, and it goes unrepaired, that the likelihood of another broken window increases. And over time, this once pristine community, well-kept, well-maintained community, over time deteriorates because neglect. Nobody's fixing, nobody's repairing, nobody's improving, nobody's tearing down the graffiti, nobody's repainting. And come on, this is what the devil would like you to think. I can handle this. All right, he's got a foothold. And once you allow a little in, you're probably going to allow a little more and a little more and a little more. For those of you who try to manage your diet and what you eat naturally, like food, <laughs> you ever have these things where you like, maybe, maybe uh, if you like chocolate, for instance, you well, you know, I, I really can't eat all that big piece of cake, so... You convince yourself just to take a little sliver, except that 20 minutes later, you had 10 slivers. <laughs> but psychologically, you actually don't feel that bad because it wasn't all at once. You didn't carry around this plate. You just like walk around, come get another one. Come on, that's what the devil's doing to us. Just take a little bit. Then you get on the scale, whoa, what happened? It was just a sliver. No, it was several slivers. Those slivers added up. And so he's just trying to get in there, trying to get a foothold. What? A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Deuteronomy chapter 11 says, fix these words of mine in your hearts. These, fix these words of mine in your hearts. Fix them in your hearts. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them around your foreheads. Come on. He said, keep this word of mine constantly before you. What does fixing, words, what does fixing these words mean? In 2024, try posting God, God uh, try uh, posting uh, God's word, where you spend a lot of time. Is it your cubicle? Is it your office? Is it in front of your mirror? Is it in front of your television? Start posting things that you can see. That doesn't work for you. Uh, place post-it notes in your bathroom, on your mirror. Put post-it notes on the dashboard of your car. Uh, you can put reminders on your refrigerator. Maybe in the refrigerator. Maybe you spend more time inside than you do looking at the door. Put some reminders. Change the wallpaper on your phone. Change the wallpaper on your phone to maybe have the Word of God on there. You can actually set reminders on your phone. Did you know that? You can set remi- you, 2024, what is fixing these words look like? Put some reminders on your phone. Your phone can send you a message every day. At a certain time of day, it can send you messages. And what if you have your phone ask you some questions? Uh, Maybe it, maybe it puts, comes up and has this question for you before you start your day. Maybe it's 6 a.m. Who sits on the throne of your heart? That's the only question that's asked. Because what does that do? It takes your attention and focuses on it. Who, who does sit on the throne of my heart? Or maybe having to send, send you a, the question, uh, who are you living for today? Who are you going to live for today? Where are you giving your attention? What are you storing in your heart today? The psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. When I get the word of God inside of me, I'm not as apt to sin. Because the Spirit of God then makes that word alive and he brings it to my remembrance. I'm going to, ah, and the Spirit of God says, the word of God says, I said, that's right, it does. I'm a man of God. I've got to protect the treasure God's given me. And there are men of God out in this, in this congregation. There are women of God out in this congregation. Protect the gift God has given you. How do you do that? Manage your thoughts. Manage your mind. Manage your heart. So as you get ready to close here, the psalmist also said, create in me a clean heart, O Lord my God, and renew a right spirit in me. Create in me a clean heart. And you might be here today and you say, well, I'm a Christian. True. You may be, very well be a Christian. But this person was a man of God. 
And he's asking God, create me a clean heart. Why? Because he had recognized that his heart had become contaminated in some way. And maybe you're sitting in this, in this congregation today and you're thinking, yeah, yeah, I've let some things go. God wants to clean, clean and renew. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, talk, talk into the church. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse. So I'm speaking to those of you right now who, are, who would, say, would say, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. Does your heart need cleanse today? Do you need to lay some things down today? Do you need to come back to God today? The Bible also speaks of those who have, who have seeking hearts. It says, when you seek me, you will find me if you look for me with your whole heart. 